actually uh, the title was attachment inhibitors, and as you see, the S almost vanished um, because there's no not too much um, to to be said about the the large variety of inhibitors. How do I advance the slide now? Just as a disclaimer, um, this lecture that you that you find in the book, this lecture aims at as an, in, in, with an interactive uh, character to educate junior physicians and researchers. And I'm particularly pleased to see so many very experienced young research among, researchers among you. But what I will do is I will stay a bit more on the technical side of attachment inhibition because I think it's a principal concept that we should not lose out of sight. When we talk about viral entry, in particular about HIV entry, and here begins, begins the interactive part, there are so many steps that we can consider and we have lost sight of. Uh, anybody able to tell me how many steps there are that we can consider for HIV entry? Thank you, yes, it's a number. So the very first step is the interaction of CD4 with, with envelope, meaning the virus comes in and its envelope needs to find the receptor. It needs to bind a second receptor, we call it co-receptor, then in the case of HIV, there will be a membrane contact. That contact leads to the exposure of a hydrophobic domain in the envelope, glycoprotein 41, which is a transmembrane protein. Then it pulls the other membrane, meaning the host membrane, towards it, which causes membrane fusion. And then the intact nucleocapsid can enter the cell. Now, when we think about it, my first question was, why would a virus control this entry so tightly. A virus like HIV enters the bloodstream, so it drops into four and a half liters of blood and floats around. And it needs to find an appropriate target cell, not only just a cell, but an appropriate target cell. Meaning it needs to get, to, uh, to avoid getting lost in translation, binding somewhere, not being the right cell, because that's the viral key principle. Once you are in, and if you're in wrong, you won't get out. Imagine HIV gets into a skin cell or into a liver cell, finds the cell cannot really express the viral genes appropriately. There's no way the, for the virus to reverse this process. Once you're in, you're in. And I think that's one of the reasons why HIV and many other viruses that are not very promiscuous, but specific for certain organs, care very much for the early steps of not only binding, but a tight binding and an attachment before they enter the cell. Now, I'm adding these two sentences because I think that's also an important point. We're talking about attachment and infection of a cell as a very early event. That's the first event that ever happens, but it only is an early event that ever happens when the virus enters the body for the first time. So this is very relevant for PrEP, and it may be relevant for very early infections before a large body of cells has been infected. Because in chronic infection, I just turned that argument around, in chronic infections, it's the last event after protease activation and maturation of the particle. And it's then only the first step before reverse transcription. Let's remember this, in a chronic infection, it's just one step in the rolling life cycle and it's not any different from any of the other steps inhibiting the viral life cycle, principally. How does uptake happen? Uh, we have discussed this for a number of years and uh, have gone back and forth, and now we believe there are two key principles of how HIV enters its host cell. The first is, and it's almost half of what it really does, depending on the cell type, its entry into coated pits as we know it from any other viruses and then fusion inside this coated pit or it can be a direct membrane fusion at the surface of the membrane always liberating the intact um, nucleocapsid within which the reverse transcription occurs and we then call it reverse transcription complex. So we are dealing with this very early step of a virion outside the cell and before the step of reverse transcription, and this is what we will be concentrating on this morning. So how can we then inhibit HIV in principle? For example, and this was one of the earliest approaches in HIV medicine, to hit the virus on the side where it would like to bind, but finds receptors everywhere. 
So producing soluble CD4, flooding the body with this, not knowing what else it could do, but with this saturating the virus and giving the virus no chance of finding the target cells because the envelope has already interacted with the receptor. We could inhibit the binding of the glycoprotein to the cell, so that's a very early event, which is actually the low affinity step, first step. Then we can uh, interfere with the second step of the very same protein, glycoprotein 120, interacting with the secondary receptor, the chemokine receptor. Or we can prevent a conformational change that needs to occur. So once again, envelope binds to the cell, and then it creates a hydrophobic pocket in order to expose the fusion domain. If you look at the very end terminus of GP41, it's so, uh, solely hydrophobic, so it cannot be dangling out from somewhere. It can only be exposed once you have created this hydrophobic pocket in order to pull the uh, virus very close to the um, host membrane and uh, leading to fusion. I mean, if you remember your childhood, um, when I was young, I always thought to make big soap bubbles by just getting them together. But you don't get fusion. You only get two bubbles clinging together. And it's the same thing of the virus with the cell. It's not an easy event of fusing two membranes. So there's energy involved. And for this, it's a very directed process that needs to occur here. And the last step would be then blocking the fusion domain, although it's exposed, but getting it into the wrong conformation so that it cannot function. So this is the um, uh, uh, six helix bundle formation that we know from the interference with, uh, of, of T20 with the process. So these are the possible events of attachment and post-attachment inhibition. So quite a variety of different things that pharmaceutical industries can become creative about and let's see what has been tried and what has been done. So first of all, what, if, to make it a bit more visual, what happens upon an, a successful attachment is that we look at human lymphocytes, at least with syncytium-inducing viruses, as we used to call them long ago. Those are viruses that can cause massive fusion, but it's just the quantity. It's not the quality of being able to fuse membranes, whereas the CCR5 viruses would not. It's just an exaggeration of the steps. So yes, here we see that several cells, so these little dark dots are individual cells, can fuse and uh, we created a cell that turns blue when you, when you infect it, and you can very nicely see, or I hope you can see, that in these syncytia, as we call them, these big bubbles here, these are many, many cells having fused, and the white spots inside are nuclei. So many cells fuse. That's, of course, overdoing it. HIV only needs to fuse itself with a cell, or in the next round, an infected cell needs to a fuse with a second cell which was uninfected. That's all it takes. It doesn't need more than one cell. So this is what smarter people uh, do and how they see it when you look at the interactions taking place. So once again, here's the viral membrane up here at the top. Then you have glycoprotein 41 as a trimer anchored into the virus. Glycoprotein 120 exposed to the outside and forming, if you wish, the crown. This is able to interact with different parts of itself with a cellular CD4 molecule, pulling several CD4 molecules to, to itself, forming this complex, and then forming this tight pocket here, which exposes in the second round via the three, V3 loop uh, to the chemokine receptors, probably also several molecules involved in a single interaction event and then leading to the exposure of, hidden in here, the end terminus of GP41 towards the membrane, which then mediates the shortening of the distance between this membrane and this membrane, causing the lipid bilayers to fuse. So this is what we are dealing with um, in, in terms of uh, HIV biology. And this does not show it because uh, the sugars have been removed, but one of the big problems is that these interactions here look very smooth. Here is interaction between GP120 and CD4, or the V3 loop, and the chemokine receptor, and everything looks like very approachable for pharmaceutical industry, but you have to put it into sugar frosting. And heavy glycosylation, particularly of GP120 in this, renders it quite inaccessible and invisible to the host immune defense. And if a cell, or if the body was um, successful in detecting HIV, 
HIV has already moved on by changing its glycosylation pattern. And we know that neutralizing activity, so we're talking about antibodies now, is um, quite significant in patients, but it's always delayed by months or even half a year. So let's go into the uh, attachment inhibition. So yes, there was an inhibitor published in the early 1990s, as you see here from this in, in this paper from 1991. So binding soluble CD4, just truncating the transmembrane element of it, was able to interfere with HIV. And as you see in this cell model, you can, by increasing the concentration of the soluble CD4, that's the dark circles, by increasing the concentration, you can clearly, in vitro, inhibit replication of the virus to almost zero. Almost zero means there's a little bit left, and the difficulty begins when you look at clinical isolates. So this was not, this was done in a lab isolate, and as soon as you go into clinical isolates, you see that it's much more difficult, and this is why this failed and never became a drug, because we call it a type-specific inhibition. So yes, you can find viruses that can be neutralized with soluble CD4, but as soon as you look in the big diversity of HIV globally, you see that you don't have a chance. And go back to the very first slide, it's the principle of the virus to bind with relatively low affinity first, that's a CD4 interaction, and then tighten that binding via the secondary receptor, and only then lock in to the cell that you want to infect. So that principle shows that, yes, the principle of approaching the virus can work, but it's not sufficient. Another concept was then turning it around and saying, okay, let's not look at anti-CD4, but look at the envelope side. And of course, the easiest, the earliest was looking at patients who have an immune response, looking at animals that show an immune response to SIV and related viruses, and construct antibodies. And yes, there was an antibody. Again, this is very early days, huh? 1995, Tanox published an anti-GP120 antibody, the Tanox TNX355. And we had it in the lab in 1990. I worked uh, for a pharmaceutical company in that, at that time. And I had some cellular models and I found, yes, I can very significantly inhibit several lab isolates with this. But on clinical isolates, again, I was unable to completely block uh, infection. I could reduce the titers, but never managed to uh, block it, although I went up to 10 micrograms per milliliter concentrations, kind of paracrystallizing a patient if you have to use very high antibody um, levels. So those were early days. We have much better antibodies, and there are now approaches and uh, even funded research that claims we have broadly neutralizing antibodies. Let's see what they can do. They try to avoid binding to these highly glycosylated sites, more, if you wish, from the side of this mushroom that I showed you, and try to block the virus by preventing its conformational changes that it needs in order to accommodate all the steps before the cell, the virus can fuse to the cell. So once again, this did not really become a drug. I'm saying not really, because it still is in development uh, with Timate Biologics and uh, being produced now by uh, Wu Xi, a, a Chinese company. And they think they can do that um, as a, a potential compound for preventing infection. So I don't know if it will ever show up in PrEP, but this is the idea. And remember, it's an antibody. You cannot easily orally formulate it and take a pill once a day. But let's see if that continues to, to develop. Then there was another uh, big approach, um, and I'm showing you a selection of various compounds showing up again in the early 90s, up here, or throughout the 90s, some of these compounds are still in use in research. Other compounds dropped dead because either the, um, they were not efficacious or there were side effects not uh, reminiscent of the specific class, but for this very uh, compound, you may remember the sad story of Aplaviroc. And the only one surviving, well, merely surviving, is probably Maraviroc, a compound that is able to interfere with the chemokine receptor. And uh, Mike Westby once drew this uh, picture saying, once again, here's the cellular membrane, and inside the cellular membrane we have this chemokine receptor, a seven transmembrane protein that is a signaling protein, so it's recognizing its ligand up here outside the cell, and then it signals inside the cell, meaning it does something inside the cell. And this is very important for immunologic response, 
for cell mobilization. So yes, it has a function. And uh, a pharmaceutical developer would uh, stay away from such a compound because it looks like we will be interfering with major points. But you all know that CCR5 seems to be a safe target. Why? Because we have the biological proof. Uh, depending on where we are, up to 15% in the population and among us, maybe at least heterozygous for a mutation, taking out 32 nucleotides, rendering CCR5 non-functional, so the Delta 32 mutation is quite common, and people live a normal life. So the idea was, okay, why not block CCR5 if naturally we can live without but HIV cannot, so that led to the concept that was successful in one person in the world, which is the Berlin patient. But the principle is we are still dealing with an attachment inhibition, and we would uh, be able to interfere with this. However, of course, there are mechanisms that we call mechanisms of escape. The second one, of course, is a, resistant of a, a resistance of a virus to the compound. So if the virus binds inside this pocket, the idea is that this would distort the outside surface around the V3 loop and HIV cannot bind anymore. However, if HIV learns to recognize a distorted V3 loop, that we would call resistance by uh, mutations as we're used to with in protease and, and RT. And the second, what people would call escape, is the selection of a CXCR4 inhibit, uh, CXCR4 uh, tropism. And those who know me know that that always aggravates me because I think that's a proof of concept rather than a failure. If in a patient there's no CCR5 tropic virus left, I would call that success rather than failure. But we don't have to discuss this in the context of this uh, lecture. So the last step then is, and that's uh, one of the more successful stories at times where we didn't have many good inhibitors. This is the story of enfuvitide. Um, as a, uh, called T20, as a six helix bundle disturbing substance. In fact, it's not an easy compound. It's not a small molecular weight compound as we like to see it. And this is why I drew it for you. You don't have to read the amino acids, but it's a peptide. Right? It's 42 amino acids long. It's a long peptide, meaning everybody who is into pharmaco, uh, kinetics and uh, pharma pharmaceutical development knows that this is a nightmare. How do you formulate this? How stable is it? How do you get it to the site of action? It worked. It doesn't work as, with, with an oral formulation, as you know. But what it does is it interferes with this last step. So I'm highlighting here the last step. So these are the binding events at the membrane. Here is the virus binding to the membrane. And then GP41, as a trimer, forms a double, has a double sequence that can form this six helix bundle. And as you see, it's the interaction, shown here, an interaction of GP41 and then a condensation of these helices to that bundle and T20 forms one element of this bundle. So you only have a five helix bundle plus T20 and this doesn't work for the virus and this is why it's an effective fusion inhibitor but we know it's outdated now because of formulation and side effects and long-term tolerability issues. So what's left then? Here's a summary of all those, and this is just for your, uh, when you print the, print the slides, for you to take home. So these are the different compounds that we have, and there's one left that uh, I was supposed to talk about, and that is a small molecular weight compound. Small molecular weight compounds are chemical entities that can be synthesized relatively easily. So synthesis in that field started with something like sequinavir, which needed almost 20 synthesis steps, two of which being below 70 degrees Celsius. So that was quite a challenge in, in pharmaceutical industry. We don't do these compounds anymore. So having a small molecular weight compound today means it must be formulable into a pill. It must be orally bioavailable. It should have a, a significant half-life. It sh should have little side effects, so a favorable side effect profile, and it should reach all compartments of the body. And um, in the mid 2000s, most companies or many companies gave up HIV research because we had all these wonderful RT, protease, and integrase inhibitors. Why continue? So I'm very happy to see that some co companies continue to work on other aspects, which are the very late in the single life cycle, which is maturation, and the, <coughs> excuse me, the very early, which is this attachment uh, developed by, by BMS at that time. So what really is this attachment inhibitor? I looked for, for uh, slides for representations of this, and as you see, 
So here, once again, I have shown you this, the interaction of the virus with the uh, host cell. So we need the interaction and uh, the conformational changes upon binding. So this binding occurs, that's on the left bottom, with these two receptor molecules, and then an exposure to um, those leads to a conformational change. And this is somehow indicated by this Band-Aid on that bubble. Um, with this attachment inhibitor, there's an interference with the first binding steps. I'm not saying with just the contact with CD4, but the first binding steps. And this lack of conformational adaptation to that interaction leads to a loss of function. Companies are creative, and uh, uh, a wonderful idea was, or that actually happens very often, um, if you have a compound, um, 6529, which is very active, chemists think about a more stable form, and one of them is to esterize it, meaning get it into a gastrointestinal lumen as an inactive molecule so there's no degradation, and only upon um, phosphatase activation, you see that uh, this uh, becomes active in the bloodstream and can do what it's supposed to do. So this is now the compound that um, BMS um, gave, gave on to Vive Healthcare. And as I said, I want to be a bit more on the technical side. This, we don't have to study chemistry here but it shows you that it's not a single molecule, but companies usually come up with 10, 20, 50 substances that look alike and have only minor changes. So the main scaffold is there, that's the central part, but you see that there are differences left and right, top and bottom, and these make quite significant differences. As you can see by these in vitro data on the effective concentration 50, which is in the lower or below one nanomolar range for the set of compounds, which, which was published a while ago, uh, whereas the cytotoxic concentration below is much, much higher. So we call it a cytotherapeutic or a therapeutic window. You don't want toxicity in the patient, but you want a high activity, and this is where we start. This is how we start. We do this on cells, we do this then in animals before a patient ever gets to see the compound. And we get an understanding of what's important in the chemical scaffold for the activity that we have, and this is what led to the uh, generation of uh, 29. I don't want to bug you with too many chemical points, but I just put this slide in to show that a next step then is not, when, once you have a potent, in vitro potent activity, against various viruses, you go into some other parameters or ve already very early on. You look at uh, uh, the uh, log P, log S, different parameters which have to do with solubility in uh, lipids. So we, we want to know how will it distribute in the body, uh, the stability in different environments, still in vitro. And then you come up with compounds that should be more at the top rather than at the bottom, more to the right than at the left, and you choose out of 20, 30 compounds that you have on your shelf, the one that should go into development. So this one did, and um, it's, it's now called uh, Fostemzavir, uh, a compound that uh, went into humans, and what you see here, um, a very typical example of a short period of dosing in monotherapy. So monotherapy for a week, so a very typical pattern here, and you see a dose dependence of the compound, meaning it, it's applied um, twice daily at different concentrations, and you just watch what happens to the virus. And we want to see at least a one log drop, and you easily see this, and it's dosed dependently with uh, 1800 uh, milligrams BID. You see that it drops below uh, one log, so the virus has a tenfold drop of replication in the circulation of this patient. And when you stop treatment, this is here, and you watch the washout period, you will see how the virus comes back. So two parameters that we have to watch here. One is how deep is the drop. So for some integrase inhibitors, we see a 1.5 log drop, but a one log drop is very common among many inhibitors. And you want to see what happens if you stop to the recovery. So those compounds that are very stable in tissue and hang around along can lead to a delayed, and you see there's a slight delay before the virus comes up again. So from here to here is already a day. So that means the, virus, uh, the, the antiviral compound has a good chance of uh, staying around long enough so that we can dose it appropriately. A very standard um, testing which led to 
the breakthrough designation for HIV treatment. So there was uh, the FDA allowed the compound a more rapid development, pro uh, the development plan. And then in the phase B, it, uh, 2B study, which is a first randomized trial, it showed uh, efficacy. And as you see here, uh, the first aspect is, of course, looking at the patient. How does the patient do when you dose? And this is now a 24-week study. And you can see, once again, um, initially dose dependently. So some patients have a delta, meaning from here to here, a small data. Uh, other patients, particularly those in the lower, uh, in the higher concentration range of the drug, have a very significant increase over this period, increase of CD4 cells, which is a very good sign. And um, that is exactly what we would be expecting, along with the um, virus decline. Um, and you see, again, here this, this data for eight days, we see that dose-dependently the virus can be controlled. So this compound is moving on uh, towards further development because we have a very significant uh, reduction of viruses and uh, of the virus and uh, an increase in CD4. And the question is how many patients now in a longer period reach um, below 50, so below level of detection, and uh, as you can see, um, even the low doses, so this is 400 milligram up to 1200 milligram compared to adazanavir, you see that the uh, viral loads, um, the viral load decline is very significant, meaning patients reaching um, below 50 is approaching something between 80 and 100%, which we would be expecting for a compound. And of course, these compounds will be part of a, a, com a combined retroviral therapy in order to um, exert their potency. We're expecting more than just additivity because it's a different mechanism of action. Syn showing synergism, we always find it difficult. Uh, if you combine in vitro several drugs and you want to show synergy between the drugs, meaning two drug classes, multiplying the effects is tricky with HIV. Uh, I believe this uh, is due to the rate-limiting step being different. So the, the more potent drug will show a bigger effect and you will not see easily in an in vitro setting what happens with the other drug. But we all know that ART as combined retroviral therapy is efficacious. So adding another drug class is uh, very important. And of course, one of the, the, the last uh, aspects then is to see how does that interfere, this compound interfere, or how um, does the compound work when you um, combine it with other drugs, and what would be mechanisms of escape that we can anticipate? So two mechanisms. The first one is, could there be other aspects? We know that there are some cells that don't seem to need CD4 plus CCR5, but actively take up the virus. So when we talk about dendritic cells, they can probably take the virus actively up and do something with it without the need of the CD4 interaction. So can we in vivo see such an effect? And the answer is we cannot, meaning when we look at cell systems, I don't have the time to go into the details, when we go into um, 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 viruses that are resistant to un other entry inhibitors, which are the classical envelope interfering inhibitors, we see that the activity remains the same, and the gray bars remains the same for BMS. So it does not follow the typical uh, uh, route of uh, resistance development. But of course, there will be something like escape. And when we look into um, mutations that cause a reduction of uh, activity, uh, mutation 426 M426L pops up as the first, I would say. I mean, why should it be different from any other compound? It is an in, uh, inhibitor that needs to interact with the protein, and if the protein changes, and here it's the envelope protein, then we see that this primary substitution leads to a lower response to uh, 529. Um, particularly when you look at patients where it was not present and under therapy it developed, so uh, it is there, but the statement here was, um, while the presence of the substitution at baseline does not completely preclude response, meaning we would call it the, the diminished response, um, it seems to be a predictor for a, at least the beginning failure of this treatment. So we have to watch out for 426 and probably additional mutations once it's widely used in the clinics. Um, and uh, that is, of course, the natural course of any compound because there's no magic bullet that prevents any mutations from happening. Now, turning this around and saying, okay, well, if that happens, what will happen to the other compounds? I think this is one of the most trivial experiments that FDA always asks. If you have your mutant virus, 
that you cannot treat with your drug, how will the other drugs work? I mean, here comes the educational part number two. What do you think happens if you have a mutation that causes an effusion inhibitor to fail and you add a protease inhibitor? I'm sorry. So what was done here is T20 was used, and what a surprise, T20, which has a totally different mechanism of action, is still active. And if you look at the uh, antibody, the, the former Tanox antibody, it's also still active, so it's unaffected. What it does say, though, it says that the mechanisms are truly different. The mechanism of resistance development is not that envelope changes and all of a sudden nobody who interferes with the envelope can function anymore, but it's a very delicate change that only affects the BMS compound rather than a class-wide uh, interference with attachment and entry inhibitors. So there are a few issues that remain to be addressed, and I think uh, when we read, reduce baseline susceptibility, that's susceptibility of, uh, uh, of the patient to the drug, um, is found in 12% of patients due to polymorphism. So envelope is very polymorphic, so we have to anticipate that some strains or maybe some subtypes may not be as susceptible as others, but the correct dose and uh, the, the dosing still have to be established in, in the clinics in order to address this appropriately. And uh, along with this, we don't have enough data yet to uh, grossly say, okay, all subtypes can be equally treated. We hope this will be the case, and there's no indication to assume that it will not be the case. I don't have any information for HIV-2, but it's probably too early to say. And then we will have to see which kind of resistance profile will occur in therapy. I think we are past the times of the early 90s where the companies developing protease inhibitors said, we did a clinical trial, and within half a year, we couldn't find a single resistance. So we know resistance will occur, but we'll have to uh, come, come up with more details on that profile. So with this, I sum up. And summing up means we are dealing with this very step here. So the early step of a virus recognizing the cell before it can enter the cell, and you have find summarized all inhibitors and inhibitory concepts that lead all the way up to the maturation step where you either look at the virus in the protease inhibitor or um, you look at the substrate of the viral enzyme th with the maturation inhibitors, and then we are linking back to the very first step. So there is no early and late anymore once the patient is chronically infected, but we will certainly have, and I'll keep an eye on this interesting class uh, that should uh, more efficaciously, hopefully, bridge between the late and the very early events. With this, I would stop and uh, open up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.